Okay, so real quick, um, in section one two, they talk about angle relationships, and and I don't know. I've always been a little bit torn on. Well, geez, I don't know if we really need to go over this because a lot of you probably just understand that when I look at this angle here and this angle, they're the same. But it, I guess it's important to know why they're the same and what property allows us to do that. So, in section 1-2, it's called angle relationships. These are the four things that we need to know. We need to know vertical angles, alternate interior angles, alternate exterior angles and corresponding angles okay i kind of quickly drew a quick little diagram and we could go through and list them all and kind of talk about which ones are which and then we'll show you how to apply them to these two problems okay and then we'll move on from there all right so uh given two parallel lines l and m so l and m are parallel uh with a transversal t and we just call it transversal, it goes through two parallel lines. So looking at vertical angles, if I was to start at angle one, what would be its vertical angle? Four would be. So we would say that angle one is the same as angle four. And then we could go through and list them all. Two would be the three, five would be to eight, uh, and six to seven. There you go. So vertical angles, those two angles are equal to each other. They're the same angle, okay? Now we move to alternate interior. So here, when you think of alternate interior, alternate means opposite sides of the transversal. Interior means the angles inside the parallel lines. So if I was to start with angle three, what would be its alternate interior angle? Six. six. So angle three would be the same as angle six. Angle four would be the same as angle five. So do you see that they're alternate, they're opposite sides of the transversal, and they're on the inside interior of the angle. Now if we do alternate exterior angles, it's kind of exactly the same thing, except now they're the exterior angles. If I start at angle one, it's alternate. Exterior angle would be eight. So angle one is to angle eight, and angle two is to angle seven. Okay? Corresponding angles are two angles that are formed by the transversal and are on the exact same position for each parallel line. So if I was starting at angle one, which, which is on angle L, what would be the exact same angle on angle M? Five. So we would say that one and five are corresponding angles. They're both obtuse angles, as you can see, and they're in the exact same position. So we got a whole bunch of these. One is to five. Two would be to six. Uh, three would be to seven. And four would be to eight. So there's our corresponding angles. Now what would you call angles one and two? Angles one and two would be what? Supplementary, right? Um, angle one plus angle two would equal 180 degrees. Alrighty. So how you're going to apply these is they're going to give you all different kinds of problems, something like this, and they just want you to find the missing angle. So we're going to use the properties that we did here. Well these two angles are what? What would you classify them as? Uh, they're not vertical, alternate, exterior. And we know that they're equal. And I, and I mean, I probably didn't even have to go over this. You could probably look at it and say, well, that's an acute, that's an acute. These are probably the same angle, okay? So just like we kind of did yesterday, I would just set these equal to each other. And now I would just solve for x, okay? They're equal to each other by alternate interior angles, exterior angles. Let's go ahead and solve it real quick. So I get 2, 2x minus 40, uh, add 40 to both sides. 42 is equal to 2x, divide by 2, x is equal to what, 21? Now again, this is not what I'm looking for, I'm actually looking for the angle measure. So now just take 3 times 21, 
and add two to it. So that's 63 plus two. So this angle here is 65 degrees. Now, naturally, since these two angles are equal to each other, then we naturally know that that's 65 degrees. So that's kind of the problems that you do today. And they might look like this. They could be vertical angles. They could be whatever, okay? All right, moving on to triangles real quick. Uh, first off, what do all the angles of a triangle have to add up to? 180, every single time, okay? So realize that all the angles of a triangle always equal 180. Well, by knowing that, I can find the missing angles now, okay? I could just say, I know that all of these angles have to add up to 180, and now I can solve it. Uh, 6x is equal to 180, divide by 6, x is equal to 30, okay? So I know that this angle here is 30 degrees, then I know that this would be 2 times 30, which is 60, and I know my diagram's not labeled right here, but that would be 90, okay? Any questions on that? That's section 2. We only do a few problems, too. I mean, I don't think we need to do it. It's not a big part of what we do for trig, okay? All right, but they do pop up from time to time. All right, moving on. Section 1-3, more importantly, this section is very important. It is the basis of the rest of the year, okay? If you don't know your six trig functions and how to set them up, then you will be really limited of what you can do. Okay. All right, here we go. So first off, I started off with, I started off with just a real quick, what you guys are going to be doing today is all you're going to be given is a point, x, y, two, three. From that point, you will be able to set up the six trig functions, okay? And so all we're doing is understanding our ratios and how things are set up, all righty? So first off, what I wanted to start off with is this. If I was given the point x, y, and I told you to graph it, notice that this would be my x value and this would be my y, my y value. Do you notice that I can form a right triangle off of this? So anytime that I know a point, I can form a right triangle. I know this, I know this, and then I go from this point back to the origin. And then there is my right triangle, okay? This symbol here is theta. Again, we kind of use the Greek alphabet for a lot of our symbols. So that's theta. Whenever you see theta, that is, that means angle measure, okay? That's our angle measure, okay? Theta is always formed between the hypotenuse and the x-axis, always there. Okay, and as we do some problems today, you'll see how to draw them. Okay, like some people, when they do a point, like this point right here, they'll draw their triangles like this. And they'll do that. No. It's always between the x-axis and the hypotenuse. Theta's here. So my perpendicular has to be to the x-axis. So whenever we draw our, our triangles, they're always formed, the 90 degree is always formed on the x-axis. Now, I know that with your geometry that you would usually call this point C, right? We, we do the Pythagorean theorem. But in trig, we do it a little bit differently because in trig, this point, if I can do it, let's see if I, how good I can do it here. Why do you think I call this value R? Because it represents a radius. Okay, and this is where the unit circle is formed. And the unit circle can tell us all of our values for certain trig functions. So a lot of times in trig, you know, sometimes I'll refer to our value as our C value, as our hypotenuse, but a lot of times I'll refer to it as R because it's a radius. But whether it's an R value or whether it's, I just run the Pythagorean theorem of C squared equals A squared plus B squared, it's the same thing, okay? The sum of the legs squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared. And it doesn't matter if I use X and Y's or A's and B's. Same thing, okay? 
All right, any questions off that? Pythagorean theorem, we're gonna have to run that today, every single problem, okay? And we'll do it when we do in our example. All right, let's first, let's move on to this. Let's move on to the six trig functions, okay? I have the first three listed. They're the most common ones. You may be familiar with Sokotoa. If not, it's super helpful to help you remember all your trig functions, okay? I'm gonna come over here and kind of draw a bigger triangle. Put theta right here. I'm gonna label this one, two, and three for right now, okay? There's a couple terms that you need to make sure that you understand. If I'm looking at this angle measure right here, what side, one, two, or three, would be the adjacent leg to theta? The adjacent, what do you think? Two. two. Two would be my adjacent. So I would refer to this as my adjacent. What leg would be my opposite leg? Three. 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 Opposite is the, if I drew a line right through the angle measure, what side does it hit? That would be your opposite. And then the hypotenuse is always the longest leg of the triangle. The hypotenuse is always the easiest one to spot. It's always opposite of 90 degrees, okay? So you have to really make sure that you understand what is your opposite, what is your hypotenuse, and what is your adjacent. So let's just say I had a really weird triangle like this. I put theta over here and I labeled it one, two, three. What angle or what side measure to theta would be your hypotenuse? Two. two. What side would be your opposite? Three. Three. And what would be your adjacent? One. One. Notice that your adjacent is always the side that connects to the hypotenuse. So your adjacent is the side measure that helps you form that angle measure. Okay? So by knowing this now, if you just kind of remember Sokotoa, think of sine opposite over hypotenuse, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent opposite over adjacent. Okay, so it, it's just really helpful for you to remember all your ratios. Okay, so we know that sine, and I'm going to just kind of quickly write it here, is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. Now, each one of these trig functions has, has an inverse, okay? So you have to know all six of them. You just can't know the three. Now, granted, when we start doing word problems and solving right triangles, everybody's gonna use sine, cosine, and tangent. But there are so there is also cosecant, secant and cotangent. So the, the inverse of sine is cosecant. Cosecant, okay? So the inverse of sine is cosecant. And when I say inverse, all that does is it just flips them. Cosecant is equal to hypotenuse over opposite. Secant is the opposite of cosine. And some people get this mixed up. People are like, well, why can't they say sine is to secant, like S to S? And I don't have an answer for that. I don't know why they did it this way, okay? But just make sure you don't get those two backwards. So if you know cosine is A over H, then secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. They're just inverses. Tangent is cotangent, cotangent. And that would be adjacent over opposite. Okay, so make sure you know your ratio for the six trig functions. Now, another way to kind of do this, like when you have Sokotoa here, maybe think of this as CSC, think of this as SEC, and think of this as cotangent. Because for some people, when you don't deal with them a lot, if I know that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, then I know cosecant is H over O. I, I just know it's the reversed. And if I know cosine is A over H, then secant is H over A. So if you kind of remember Sokotoa, but also add these three inverses right below it, you just know they're reciprocals. Okay? Any questions off the six trig functions? Now, by the way, on your calculators, you know, I know you might not have a calculator, when you see this key sine to the negative one, 
this is not cosecant on a calculator. Okay, so a lot of people think when I ask them to find the cosecant of 1.2, they'll go second sign of that. And that's not the same thing, so be careful of that. I can't think of any calculators that have the inverse trig functions on them. Okay, it, it used to be older calculators always had all six trig functions, but newer ones don't do them anymore. Okay, all right, so here's what you guys are gonna do today. You're gonna be given a point, and we'll kind of do a couple examples here. Um, you're gonna be given a point, and we'll just kind of do an easy one to start with. Here's what I suggest you do on your homework. What you want to do is you want to make a table so that you don't have to write so much. So what you're going to do is when you start your homework, and I'm going to move this down just a little bit, is do this. Take a minute and just make a table real fast. I like to go sign, then I will do its inverse next, then I'll do cosine, then I'll do secant, I'll do tangent, and I'll do cotangent. So this way, when you're finding all your answers, you don't have to rewrite them over and over and over. You could just make a chart. Okay, this is what our time quizzes look like. I'm gonna have six trig functions listed, and you have to go through and give me all the answers. Okay, and so just kind of get in the habit of doing it. All right, so here we go. So here's what you need to do. So given this point, what we're going to do is we're going to sketch it. We're just going to sketch the point 3, negative 4. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to go over 3, down negative 4. So here's the point 3, negative 4. Just by that point, you should be able to tell me the ratio of the six trig functions. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to form a triangle. We're going to come through here. There's our x value. We drop it to here. So again, remember that our 90 degree angle is always formed on the x-axis. Now I just connect this point back to the origin. There's my triangle. I just formed my triangle. Now I know that this measurement is 3 and I know that this measurement is negative 4. Just label your x and your y. So how am I going to find the hypotenuse? I'm going to run the Pythagorean theorem, okay? Now again, whether you like to think of it as r squared equals x squared plus y squared, or if you want to think of it as c squared equals a squared plus b squared, that's all fine and dandy, okay? Let's just do Pythagoras or the Pythagorean theorem because that's probably what most of you are used to. So I would just say this. I'm just going to run the Pythagorean theorem. I know two legs, I need to find the hypotenuse. Okay, and I get c squared equals 9 plus 16. Be careful of that. When you square a negative, it's always positive. If you have a bigger number on your calculator today, like this, and you just enter it as negative 15 squared, your calculator is going to say negative 225. Okay, make sure that you understand that you have to put it in parentheses if you want to get the exact answer. All right, here we go. c squared equals 25, square rooted. C is equal to plus minus 5. Now we're talking about a distance, okay? And what do you think your hypotenuse is going to be? Is it going to be positive 5 or negative 5? It's always going to be positive. Now we can go to work. You can tell me the ratio of all six trig functions. Here we go. Here's theta sitting right here. So let's find sine. We know that sine is opposite, which would be what number? Nope. Negative 4 over hypotenuse, 5. So this would be negative 4 fifths. Well, that means I immediately know that cosecant is negative 5 fourths. They're inverses. I just take its reciprocal. So once I know sine, I immediately know, cos or I immediately know cosecant. Okay, let's move on to cosine. What is your adjacent here? 3 hypotenuse, 5. So this would be 3 fifths. So this makes that 5 thirds. Okay. Lastly, tangent is opposite over adjacent. Opposite over adjacent. Opposite leg is negative 4. Adjacent is 3. So negative 4 thirds. So that makes this negative 3 fourths. 
There you go. You listed the value of the six trig functions. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Let's throw some radicals at you now. Here we go. Very so This is what I would call a perfect triangle, right? Because when I squared these two numbers, I, I took the square root and I had a perfect number. But that's not going to be the case all the time. Very seldom did they become perfect because it's hard to get a perfect triangle. So let's say I gave you the point uh, negative two, let me think here, I will go three. Negative two, three. Okay, so let's quickly sketch it. Now, by the way, when I do these diagrams, I don't really draw them to scale. I did that last one. What I like to do is this. I like to, I don't like to be all bunched up where I can't see things. So I just go, okay, I'm gonna go negative two up three. So I form my triangle and I don't have to have it scaled. I just said that's negative two and that's three. I just wanna see what I'm working with. Okay, now again, I always come back from this point back to the origin. Here's theta right there. Now we're going to run the Pythagorean theorem. So it's going to be c squared is equal to 3 squared plus negative 2 squared. I get c squared equals 9 plus 4. c squared equals 13. Square root it. There's nothing I can do with root 13. Now, if you get like the square root of 8, then you would clean that up to 2 root 2. If you get a, a radical that can break down, then you always break it down. It's like you always reduce fractions. You always reduce radicals when they pop up, okay? So I know that this is root 13. Now here we go. We're going to have to do some radical work here. Okay, let's find sine. What would be my opposite leg? What would be the hypotenuse? Root 3. Is this an acceptable answer? 3 over root 13? No. You need to rationalize this. Okay? You're going to do this so much that you're just going to end up doing it all in your head. And that's where I want you to be. I want you to try to do this in your head. But for this first one, let's just multiply top and bottom by root 13. And I get 3 root 13 all over 13. Okay, now when I find cosecant, hint, I know that it's this answer flipped. And if you put this answer like this, don't you have a lot of work to do now? Here's a hint. This is, for those of you that show your work in that, this will save you a ton of time. Would you say that this answer and this answer are equivalent? So instead of me flipping this answer, why don't I flip my original answer? Instead of flipping this, why don't we just flip this one, which is root 13 over 3? Then I don't have to do any work. Okay? If you do flip this one, you're going to get this as your answer. All right? So, again, showing that step pays off. I know you're like, well, that's doing extra work. No, it's not. It's saving you extra work. Okay? Let's do the next one, cosine. So cosine would be, here's theta, adjacent over hypotenuse. Now, after you do this a couple times, you're probably like, I can just do this in my head. I just got to multiply top and bottom by root 13. There we go. Which one do you want to flip? The first answer or the second answer? Well, definitely the first one. Flip this one, negative root 13 over 2. Okay, no decimals, no decimals whatsoever. Everything will be in radical form. Okay, lastly, tangent. Tangent is opposite over hypotenuse. Three over negative two. Notice where I put my negatives. Okay, don't leave a negative in the denominator. You have two choices. You could put it in the middle of the fraction or you could just always move it into the numerator. Okay, but never leave an answer like that. Two <coughs> over negative three. Just move that negative, it's just easier. Just always put it on the numerator. Okay, it's just negative. All right, any questions about that? So you can see where the radicals are starting to come into play, okay? Uh, on a positive note, a lot of times your radicals are like root 13s, root 11s, root 5s, so there's not a lot of simplifying that you have to do, okay? 
One last thing, and we're not going to work it all the way through, but let's do this. What if I gave you the point root 2, 5? Root 2, 5. And I wanted you to find the third leg of that value. So if I were just to sketch this, again, notice how I do it. I just say, okay, I'm going to go over root 2, up 5. Root 2, up 5. I immediately form my right triangle, and I write theta, and I do that. But I wanted to talk about how to do the Pythagorean theorem when you have a radical. Okay, I know a lot of people are intimidated by this, but it actually kind of works out pretty good. C squared equals root 2 squared plus 5 squared. What is root 2 squared? It's just 2. So even though we started with a radical, notice that we don't have a radical there. And then this would be, what, 25? So this would be c squared equals 27, square rooted. Oh, here we go. What is the square root of 27 in cleaned up? 3, three, three, three. three root 3. Now, do you see we have to just deal with radicals the whole time? Okay, that's why I was kind of telling you when we were working with radicals and trig, they're just a daily occurrence. They're just every day. And, but eventually, like I said, you get so used to it, you just do pretty much all of it in your head. Okay? Any questions? So when you guys get to this part, this is all you do in this section, by the way. This section right here, I'm, I want you to make a table just like we did, and then that way you don't have to write out sine is this, cosine is this. Just make a table. If this is number one, this is number two, just fill out your table. Okay? All right, any questions? Kind of a lot of information. Very important. Not so much this, that is very important. We're not going to do a lot of these. We're going to do more of those. Okay? All right, here we go. So, on page, I'll just put it right here. On page 15, we're going to do one, three through six. So on page 15, that's doing this stuff, where maybe you do a problem like this, where they're going to do stuff like this, and you're just going to fill in the missing values I could put. Like they might tell you that this is 40 degrees. Fill in all the missing values. Well, if that's 40, then that's 40. If this is 40, that's 140. Then that's 140. You see how you can just chain roll right down the way? The other problems look like this, okay? All right, then for, on page 26, we're just going to, we're going to do just the evens, 2 through 20 even. But this is where you want to make your table. So once you start number 2 here, make a table, just like we did here for our notes. So like this would be number 2, then put number 4 here, so that way it saves you a lot of writing, okay? These first couple of chapters, they have you do this a lot. Like when we start our time quizzes, this is stuff that we do, okay? And so there's always, I'll usually start to shrink it up after a day or two, like we won't find all six, we'll just do fine cosine tangent or stuff like that, okay? All right, uh, if you do check answers on this section here, out of my book, they don't go in the order that we do. They don't do sine, cosecant, cosine, secant. They do sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. They just, it makes sense to me to put this and its inverse right beside it. It just makes sense to me to do it that way. But anyway, your answers might look a little different. All right, how about I'm going to come by, check off your homework from yesterday. I find my clipboard. But lots and lots of radical work.